So one other question before we shift from AI. Have you been following all the reporting about the models hitting a point of diminishing returns? And I, I know these are sort of a black box, but do you have any guesses as to what might be happening there and, and what that could mean for the space? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, these stories are sort of catnip because mm -hmm. I've always been on the skeptical side about large language models being AGI and and going beyond what they seem to be. I, I think there's a few challenges here. I mean, there's there's a, um, I mean, number one, there's just there's just a, a data question, right? Like we've sort of harvested all the data on the internet. There's a lot of data, I think in, in YouTube videos, that is a big one people have talked about that that could potentially be, be leveraged. Mm -hmm. But at some point, like you're, you're better and you're more efficient. We see lots of gains there still. And, you know, like uh, smaller models are, are sort of catching up to bigger models, but that that's a function of like, they're just more efficient and they do things sort of more, more effectively. And, it doesn't solve the, well, where's GPT-5 or, or what, how good is sort of GPT-5 or Gemini-2 or whatever it might be. And so th like there's a, a sort of natural explanation there. So is there a question, can you actually make data? Is there synthetic data? Can you figure out different sorts of things? All those have been been sort of questions for a while. And I think they continue to be be significant ones. That's number one. Number two, the problem with all the data on the internet is that all the data on the internet is actually a fraction of all the thought in the world. Mm -hmm. Like when you go online and you type something or you post a video, there's a lot of thought and thinking and preparation and and like consideration that goes into it. So I, I did three daily updates this week about earnings. I thought they were all pretty interesting. So I, I, I was, but there's also an article I'm working on. And a couple of the days, why the daily update came away? Because I was working on an article and it didn't come together. I'm like, well, I'm going to pivot. I have this, you know, earnings I want to talk about anyway. It's fine. But like, there's like, whenever this article gets posted, if it does, I'm not going to say what it's about in case it never <laughs> makes it out. <laughs> yep. It will be the product of not, of literally direct days of thought about it. Right. And then sort of broadly speaking, months, years of consideration of these sort of issues that go into it. Or like none of that interview Benioff, you read his book before you interview Benioff, and that's not accounted for in the finished product that appears on Stratechery, the text. Right. That, I mean, that one's uh, doable because you just have the book in the LLM. But yeah. like there's there, there's just there, there's huge amounts of process that goes into these finished products that despite the fact they have access to all the finished data in the world, there's actually a big hole in what the in what they don't have. Reasoning. And, yeah. Right. And, and even with something you can see like why code in some respects works better. Like one of the challenges of writing code and this kind of annoying is you have to be super literal about everything. <laughs> like you have to put like it all has to be put in there. You, be, you know, there's always like the the. You always see those joke videos where, like, uh, 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 it's usually a dad makes like their 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 kid write a list of instructions for what to do, and then it's mm -hmm. like put you know put peanut butter X Y Z, and then they follow it literally, and there's actually a bunch of intervening steps that you had to do, and so they end up with like the knife and the peanut butter sitting on top in the jar of peanut butter, just, like sitting on top of the bread or something like that, and it's yeah. like, hey, I followed your instructions exactly. It's like, oh no, and the kid's like going nuts. They have to like actually articulate every single step along the process. Like that's, you kind of had to do that with computers. They're very, very literal. They do exactly what you say. Most bugs with, compu with, with, with computer programs are actually the program doing exactly what you told it to do. Just somewhere along the way, you told it, you told it the wrong thing because you didn't think through all these sorts of bits and pieces. And so given you have to do that, if you can ingest all the code in the world, you can get a handle on some of that. Now, there's still, maybe this is part three, is the actual like creative spark, the actual creation of new knowledge. There is knowledge that comes from combining different pieces, finding links that didn't exist before. And you know the parts that you've, frequently articulated you're excited about about various sort of discoveries in, in like like uh you know biochemistry or or things along those lines that are downstream from we just have an astronomical amount of data and there's connections to be drawn that 
no human could sort of do, right. but we could discover these latent sort of this latent sort of knowledge. That is a potential con connections. And then that's right. Real human scientists can test them. That's right. That's right. I think that's absolutely a ripe area for, for, for innovation, but to the extent there is, and you believe there is some aspect of the creative spark and the drive to develop new information, where precisely in these models is that coming from? Where is that going to come from, from computers generally? I mean, we're getting into philosophical questions and the nature of humanity and consciousness and all these sorts of we're things. In the common room with Benny here. Absolutely. That's, that's right. I mean, we, yeah, we, <laughs> that's right. Room we all end so. up. We, that's right. Uh, and the, the modern stuff is potent. So, um, yep. but, but these are, but the reason why you end up here is because they actually are relevant and, your a lot of your typical sort of technologists in general tends to be fairly materialistic, like like uh, you know a, whether it be from a religious perspective, very atheistic, or or just in, like look the human the human mind is a biological thing. We can actually sort it out and figure it out. Um, I tend to be just I'm not sure what the word is uh, skeptical doubt. Like I question the extent of our knowledge about everything. Like, like you look about things like foreign policy, right. Or political programs. The challenge with all them is mistakes are so often made when you think, you know, more than you do, or you can actually accurately sketch out the second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order effects. Sometimes you do stuff and stuff happens that you didn't expect because of these complex systems look at our complete inability to really truly understand like nutrition, right? right. Like how does the human body actually work? How does it, you know, w w what are the actual processes? Uh, and I see, and, and to me is this, you know, maybe one of the other philosophical divides is these are all solvable problems. We can actually know this. And I've just, maybe this is sort of my just inherent personality. I'm skeptical. Like I, I just think in general, we, the mistakes we make as a species again and again is overstating our ability to understand. And this actually simultaneously is why I'm an optimist because I think we understate our ability to solve problems. Because like we, we we come up with stuff, we figure stuff out, we muddle through. You look at something like making chips. If you were to go back, people talk about Moore's law, more this idea of, of like the doubling in density and and change in price. Like oh, Moore's law hitting a wall. Well, you know it depends on your definition, sort of X Y Z. But that is a you look backwards and yeah, this happened, and you look forward and say this is going to happen. What is underappreciated is how many of the discoveries in that process no one knew what they were they came from different directions people recently get anchored on lithography and asml because that was a big thing in sort of the 2010s and where where tsmc sort of surpassed intel but that's one area of chip making there's also etching there's also material science there's also like like there's thousands and thousands of steps I talked to the synopsis ceo last week right like the ability to design chips using ai like they talk about, like, we think this is this capability as we're developing it is worth the equivalent of an extra process node mm. for going like three nanometer to two nanometers. Well, if we design it more efficiently, you'll get the same gains. And so then you get to the Moore's law question. It's like, well, does that count for Moore's law? If we like laid out the transistors more efficiently, it's still an improvement. And, and, and what the, the chip thing area is so interesting because there's such hard constraints and constraints often drive creativity because it's like, well, we can't solve the problem here. What is some other variable in this bit here where we can, we can solve the problem. And then you get this incredible sort of creation of, of completely new things that when you zoom out, it seems impossible. How do we actually make these things? It's, it, it's sort of staggering. And can AI do this? Yeah, it can do a lot of it, particularly the stuff we already figured out and it can do it more efficiently. Can it come up with the new constraint breaker? Maybe. We'll mm -hmm. see. Is that AGI? Is that actually consciousness? Is that the sort of creative spark? Well, me and Benny are going to have to debate that and, and sort of uh, figure <laughs> that out. Tell. But am I correct in saying that the lack of progress is relative to the nebulous goal of 
getting to AGI and getting closer to real sort of intelligence that approximates human capability. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there was a big debate, particularly, you know, a couple of years ago. I think people are starting to cool off because everyone's seeing this wall sort of being hit. That, mm-hmm. no, like, Transformers actually are the way to AGI. We just need to give them more data and scale, and that's going to be that. In this sort of scaling hypothesis. And I think the reality is we're going to need different approaches, different algorithms. O1 represents something in this regard where you're doing a lot more compute on the inference side, a lot more sort of thinking, forcing it to go down different paths and evaluate different options. And that is one shift. And there will there will be others. And so this is not an argument that AI progress is going to be stalled. Although right, the history that's, of AI, that's what I would want to clarify is that the progress. I mean, these models are still like unbelievably performant. It's just if the standard is AGI, then yeah, there probably will be a wall. But if you're looking to use them for targeted tasks and discrete data sets, then we're in a pretty unbelievable place now. And that progress is probably going to continue. Is that right? Yeah, no, yeah, no, I think there's two points. So number one, the history of AI is, oh, we finally figured it out. And then they hit some sort of wall and then it goes into a dead, like dead zone for several years. Then, oh, we figured Mm -hmm. something out and then it hits a wall. So maybe we're in another one of those sort of cycles, but the loop is always still up and to the right to a certain extent, right? The the capabilities today are just, are, are, are phenomenal. But number two, the capabilities of the transformer architecture are so incredible and I've been, you know, I, I, this is a point I've been making repeatedly. If we never progress one iota past where we are, the product overhang in that this capability to actually create new products and right. new well, ways of doing things. How to use it and revolutionize industries. Like There's years of work to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like the, the, you know, I, I'm very bullish about these, you know, all the stuff we talked about, like, why did I write the, the meta, like when I wrote the meta sort of why, why I'm so optimistic about their possibilities as a company, it's because everything I wrote in that I believe is possible right now with what we have right now. It's not yep. dependent on better AI. You, I believe that they can come up with generative UI for AR. I believe that they can create compelling and effective content. I believe they can scan every picture and make everything into an ad. To do that is going to take a very long time. And a lot of technological progress is where something is, is possible, but to actually do it efficiently and at scale is a mass is a massive engineering challenge. And uh, mm-hmm. there's just lots of things that have to be figured out. And so th- this is, I mean, like I said, I, I this news worries me because to me it slots right into a I was right sort of framework, <laughs> yeah. which is, yeah, this is not the, we're not all knowing huge leap, AIs that create their own AIs and just make humans irrelevant. I don't believe we're close to that. And I'm not sure this is even the right architecture to get there, but I'm also massively optimistic because I think what exists is pretty incredible. And in some respects, the it's so incredible that it will take that much longer to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Sort of like the internet, right? Like no, the exactly. internet's the value creation to took a clarify. while to do. Yeah, and I see a lot of people sharing these stories online and pointing to the lack of progress or the diminishing returns that some of these companies are seeing and saying, see, it's running out of steam. The AI revolution was completely overpromised, this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, I get the sense, even as someone who's generally skeptical, uh, I get the sense that we're only scratching the surface in terms of how any of this is going to be productized and what some of the changes will actually be in the years to come. So um, I don't want to overreact to, you know, Orion disappointing people out there at open AI, but, um, and Hey, well, it does, it does speak to the uh, let's all be a little more skeptical about people that spin up elaborate theories and then demand you about the future and then demand stifling regulation today. Uh, because what, what if they're, what if they're wrong? Like, like there's, this is such a trap to fall into. We're all very smart people with very active imaginations. You should not regulate based on active imaginations. Well, like there really needs to be process to regulate before you know what exactly the threats and what the concerns are like real problems have to emerge before effective regulation is crafted and implemented and um, we're not there yet so i yeah, well, understood I mean, the urge to do it 
at step zero. Well, but. the urge is that look because the AI becomes so smart, it's going to make itself and it's going to do its own programming and create its own things. And so then at that which point we can't control it. But number one, like there has to be like you have to weigh out some sort of plausible path to be there. Number two, you have to answer the question of if you regulate in one place, what's to stop it from happening somewhere else? Like mm -hmm. it, it's code. That would be my <laughs> response numbers. to that uh, concern. It's like if that possibility is is out there and realistic, then it'll happen somewhere, and we'll be. There's so much regardless. stuff that all, all the people who will follow the law are the ones that are trying to do good stuff <laughs> because mm -hmm. they're they're good people, right? Like the, I mean, <laughs> you can apply that to a lot of things. We'll just leave it at that. 